And we're live. Perfect timing, Mark. You can hear me? Yes, sir. If you'll queue up your screen, we will put out your slides for everybody. Welcome, everyone. This is another one of our National Security Decision-Making Game seminars for Gen Con. And we're glad that you are joining us. And we are just starting, so you haven't missed anything. And we're good to go. We've got at least one person in the in the audience already, so you're good to start, Mark. Do you want to start just from slides? Uh, sure. Why not? Uh, well, okay. uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, hi, uh, this is radiological weapons and physiological effects of exposure. Uh, my name is Mark McDonough. I'm a retired U.S. Navy captain, um, submarine service background, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute bachelor's degree. Uh, nuclear power program, 10 years active duty, 20 reserves. Uh, when I left active duty, I got my master's science degree in physics. And uh, I've since then uh, spent about 12 years on campus at the U.S. Naval War College. I've also been um, involved with uh, 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 submarine operations analysis, tactical development uh, for the last you know, 30 years or so. Anyway, uh, we'll be uh, we're discussing these things on a relatively... Um, a technical level, there's a whole lot of demagoguery that goes on about radiological effects and physiological effects of radiation, and we're going to try to cut through a lot of the crap that uh, that uh, you're going to see as a matter of routine and uh, discuss, th discuss things that are likely to be real. And I welcome everybody. I also want to tell you, uh, ask you please, if you have not yet, go into the event uh, site on Gen Con and redeem your tickets. We need to make sure that we get proper credit for everything we've been doing. Everybody's been watching these programs. Okay, so uh, our first, the uh, introductory slides who we are with the National Security Decision Making Game. This is our 30th year uh, as a, uh, we consider ourselves a nonprofit educational group, but we use live action role playing and role playing systems in order to try to teach uh, events of the world, uh, other countries, other, other issues, problems, uh, other decision making systems, um, try to understand how world decisions are made. Uh, we provide games and seminars on historical, military, and technology topics. Uh, we're devoted to sharing things the way we learned along the way. Our team is, includes military, government, academic, business, uh, and wargaming experience, and we appear at hobby conventions, academic, and government venues. Uh, these are based on public information, uh, the, the use of p excerpts of pictures follow the rules of fair use doctrine and creative common rules. Any opinions, errors, or omissions are, are, are ours and ours alone. Uh, most of us have at some point in the past worked for the federal government. Uh, these are, this is not a government program. They don't know we're here. They don't care. And these are not government policies we're talking about. Uh, today, we're expected to be at uh, this uh, this year at uh, DragonCon Online. We're just opening communication with them to see where they what we can do for them. We're hoping, in fact, to be able to put on a version of our Cuban Missile Crisis simulation online. We beta tested that, and it seems to be working all right. There's still going to be some learning curves, but um, a, an actual actual NS, you know, NSDM game freeform is a bit a bit in the future for us to try to figure out how to make that happen. Certainly, if you want to try to volunteer and Help us out with some of the new technologies. We'd, we'd appreciate that. Uh, we're always looking for good, good, talented help with ideas. Okay. Um, now, if we want to talk about uh, radiological effects and radio uh, radiation exposure and weapons, we need to uh, use some basic lexicon. I, those of you who just watched my lecture on Chernobyl and those who just watched Vacationing at Chernobyl heard a lot of the stuff already, but I've got to go over it again for those for anybody new who's joining us. Alpha radiation is a difference between when I watch, uh, watch the movies, they seem to mix, you know, use the word radiation when they mean contamination, vice versa. They're two separate things. Contamination is something. It's a gas. It's a solid that gives off radiation. But radiation by its nature moves at something near the speed of light. It is through your town, through your village, and, and gone before you even know about it and could possibly react. Radiation moves fast. That does damage. Contamination is something that gives off radiation. Uh, types of radiation include alpha particles. Alpha particle is a highly accelerated helium nucleus, two protons, two, two neutrons. Uh, it's going so fast, it's not going to have any electrons attached. And it can do a lot of damage if it hits you. It's electrically charged, obviously, and it's very heavy particle as far as um, not, uh, 
um, subatomic particles go, radiation goes, but it also isn't going to go very fast. The hitting power it has is also what's going to, what your epidermis is going to stop. So it's not going to enter your body and do any damage in, inside of you. The problem with alpha is if you ingest it, if it's on, if it's in the um, it's, if it's in particulate in the atmosphere that you inhale and gets stuck in your lungs, if it settles in the food that you eat, if it is uh, somehow contaminated water that you drink gets in your bloodstream, then it gets ingested in your body, can stay for months, and if it gives off something inside your body, then it's like uh, that the one the alpha particle each alpha particle is going to do a disproportionate amount of damage. Uh, beta radiation is a high uh, high speed electron or high speed positron is also called beta um, positron being the antimatter variant of an electron uh, they can do damage they can penetrate several centimeters into your body and uh, uh, break chemical bonds do other things to you that will give you it gives you some type of radiation um, uh, signature uh, positrons worse than an electron not that you could choose one or the other but because it is antimatter and it when it does slow down it will pair, find an electron and pair annihilate and give you just that much more energy to it gamma is electromagnetic radiation like visible light only much shorter frequency much um, uh, you know, shorter frequency shorter wavelength a lot more power to it and this will go uh, penetrate through your, uh, all the way through your body, breaking bonds and doing some damage. Uh, it's hard to stop. It will take you should take lead shielding, others or you know, many feet of concrete or water um, to stop gamma. So uh, that's that's a that that is one of the major problems with electron uh, with um, ionizing radiation. Neutrons, uh, high uh, high acceleration, high speed. I'm sorry, a high speed neutron. It's going to carry a lot of energy. It's going to be a bullet that hits you, and it's going to also potentially break chemical bonds. Now, that's you normally run into neutron radiation in and near reactors or in the actual reactor blast itself. But anything contamination could give could give neutrons, so uh, that that is there as well. Different types of contamination: surface contamination is particulate that settles on the uh, table surface or other type of flat surface that you then touch. Uh, then you get it on your hands, it can potentially get into your body at that point. And uh, being on the surface, if you're near it, if it's giving off this radiation, then it is touching your body, it is entering it. Um, air con airborne contamination could be gaseous or particles, dust. Dust is usually more dangerous because dust could settle in your lungs. If it's gas, you usually inhale it and exhale it, and it's gone in, your, uh, in a matter of seconds. The chance of actually decaying and delivering its radiation charge to you is, is minimal. But if it's a particulate, it can get stuck in your lungs for days or months, and then essentially its entire radiation burden is going to get dumped into your body. Uh, water contamination, again, the same particulate, same dust can settle into the water. Water itself can get activated. And that could, uh, if you ingest that, it can end up as part of your bloodstream, and then it will also deliver the entire radiation burden to you. Okay, now there are different uh, measures of radiation, radioactivity, exposure, and you know, the dose you're going to get. It's the same same way we have a metric in an English system. Um, now I have highlighted the ones that I am used to seeing. Um, but you should know these other things around. SI is the International Unit of Standards. Uh, so that's the, that's the typical unit, but uh, this tells you what they are, what, how they are defined, what their chemi what the um, uh, official symbol is for it, and what the conversion factors, and basically how, how old the thing is. So um, uh, the, uh, in terms of activity, I'm used to dealing with curies, uh, and a curie is defined as 3.7 times 10 to the 10th um, uh, a, it flips uh, radiations per second. Uh, it back, goes back to 1953, and the symbol is a CI. Exposure levels. Rankin is often used. It goes back to 1928, and, and uh, the symbol, the, uh, is, uh, the engineering symbol is R, um, defined in terms of electrostatic units per, per gram of air. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what I'll be using. Uh, as far as absorbed dose, a gray. Came into being in 1974. Not used to using that, but uh, that's what is being used more and more. I'm also I have been used to using RAD, or which is 100 ergs per gram, uh, and it goes back to 1953. And in fact, the uh, as far as ergs and grams and joules and kilograms, you could tell it's going to be a, a nice round number. So a gray is 100 RAD uh, in this in this respect. 
I am more used to using Rankin Equivalent Per Man or REM because that is a measurement of what that, that certain RAD or rank can actually do to you because uh, it, there's a, an, an implicit bi uh, biological focus to that. Um, again, 100 errors per gram of soft body tissue, and uh, we, for our purposes, we could treat that as a as a hundred one uh, hundred for the sievert. The sievert is also the same thing in joules per kilogram, so that's also used. Um, and uh, more, some things in my presentation are going to be discussing this in terms of sieverts and grays. Uh, so you know, I was taught that if you get about 500. Um, uh, 500 grays or, uh, or about 500 rad or 500 rem that will give you a 50% chance of dying without medical attention. That's just a baseline to come to. You'll usually start getting some symptoms of medical sick of uh, radiation sickness at about 100, and that is essentially then one gram or one sievert to give you possibly med possibly um, radiation sickness symptoms. Uh, where does radiation come from? We're every day of our lives are being exposed to radiation. A annual cosmic radiation at sea level will give you a certain amount. Uh, U.S. has a daily average. Uh, and this is this is going to be in millisieverts, which is that's uh, one one tenth of a uh, tenth of a, of a tenth of a rem. But okay, uh, so but you can tell it's also a logarithmic scale. So these are getting very very large. But there's um, uh, you get a get a uh, abdominal CAT scan. You get more than your your daily dose. Um, there's a worker limit, annual worker limit, and uh, and this this slide obviously came from a space site. So it uh, it talks about spending six months in the International Space Station and what 180 day trip transit to Mars and what 500 days on Mars would give you. Now, when we start talking about radiation sickness, there's a process that you should understand. There's, there are immediate symptoms which you will receive in minutes to hours and that will last four days. So four, several days, I should say. Uh, there's a latent period then. You think you've gotten better. You think you got away from it. You're feeling fine. And that will last a week to a month. And then uh, another Ill spout of illness will uh, set in. And that could last two to eight weeks to recover or until you die. And it'll depend on how much you get. The reason I put started to research this and put this lecture together is because I watched the HBO series Chernobyl, and they showed some of the um, characters there uh, showing symptoms within a few minutes of the accident. And I found that kind of unusual. It wasn't anything I was trained to. I also wasn't trained to expect to receive um, the uh, thousands of uh, thousands uh, thousands of red or rem in, in, in absorption. So I started to study this, and I, I found that yes, there, that uh, that is possible, but it, but for very very large uh, exposures. This tells you, and again we have um, gray. Uh, the gray is up on top, one to two, two to six gray. How much exposure you're getting, and then the, if you're used to Rankins or Rads or Rem, these are hundreds. So that's one to two hundred Rad, uh, two to six hundred Rad, six to eight hundred Rad. Uh, and what the symptoms are going to be immediate, how long the latent period is going to be, illness, and what your chances of, get, of dying with that and how long it will take. Uh, with 1 to 2 gray or 100 to 200 rad or ram rankin, uh, you, and it, you'll experience nausea and 5, five to 50% five, of the people who get that will experience nausea or vomiting. They'll onset of symptoms will be in 2 to 6 hours. Uh, they'll last less than an hour, less than a day, less than 24 hours. Uh, then there'll be a latency period. Those would be the immediate effect. Latency period then will be about a month, 28 to 31 days, um, after which the illness will settle in, uh, mild to moderate uh, leukopenia. Leuke that's a leukocyte count. Essentially, it's going to open you up to uh, infection in that period. Uh, your, your immune system will be weakened, compromised. Fatigue and weakness. Um, your chance of dying with or without care is 5% or less. So you'll probably get away with this. Uh, you're probably going to be pretty weak uh, to start with if you, this is, you're going to succumb to this. If you do die, it'll be take, take you six to eight weeks. Now, if we want to move forward to six to eight gray or 600 to 800 rem, um, nausea, vomiting in 75 to 100 percent of the cases. You get this, you'll probably be throwing up uh, within 10 to 60 minutes of that exposure. That's the high level of exposure again. And this will be lasting for about two days. Uh, then uh, your other symptoms you're likely to get are going to include 
heavy diarrhea in 10% of the cases, uh, and a mo a moderate headache in 80% of the cases, and moderate to severe fever in 100% of the cases. These will uh, time, be time of onset, you know, not, uh, you know less than an hour to, to uh, three, three, four hours. The latent period is going to last seven days. So you had a latent period of a month for the small exposure, but within seven days, you're going to get more symptoms. This is going to be severe leukopenia, so you're going to have a very seriously compromised immune system, high fever, diarrhea, vomiting, dizziness, or disorientation, hypotension, electrolyte disturbance. And your chance of dying without care is 95 to 100 percent. With care, it's 50 to 100 percent, and you're you're dead within two to four weeks. So that's a bad thing. That's kind of what they were. Some of the things they were showing. They're actually showing some of the effects that we saw. They were showing more in terms of 10 to 10 to 20 gray. And they showed people who were who were starting to bleed in contact with metals within a few minutes. It also matters how fast you get the dose rate. Uh, with the show's uh, dose rate delivered in terms of uh, two tenths of a gray an hour, one gray an hour, and ten grays an hour. So if you get greater than ten grays an hour, uh, your mortality is going to be on the, uh, the steeper curve. Other effects are harmful tissue reactions, in part uh, due to killing or malfunction of uh, cells after high doses of radiation uh, are received. Uh, you, the, these radiation goes right through your body. They break bonds and they start to disrupt your cells. They, they Mark, make um, deadly. Yes. Uh, the question is: Do iodine iodine pills impact these results? Or is that totally different? Iodine is a very uh, narrow thing that it it affects. Usually, I know we'll I'll go we'll go into iodine pills later. But it, no, it, it typically it won't affect your exposure to ionizing and radiation. Okay, uh, cancer develop, development and exposed indiv uh, and exposed individuals owing to mutation of somatic cells. Cancer, there's a latent period of years to decades. It's hard to actually pin down radiation exposure as the source of someone getting cancer. But we obviously know we know from studying um, effects of people uh, survived Hiroshima and Nagasaki that definitely cancer is a result of exposure to radiation. Um, the heritable effects, diseases in offspring owing to mutation of reproductive cells. These are long-term long -term effects, but they're, they're definitely there. Now, what uh, unnatural modes of exposure, we talked about natural modes, cosmic rays, whatever. What unnatural modes there would be? Nuclear weapons, obviously, are going to give you radiation. They'll, they will create um, uh, radiological effects. Uh, you know, different types of uh, detonation include air surface, subsurface, and underwater bursts. So all have different effects. Um, and the, the cleanest way to set off a nuclear weapon is an air burst where the fireball doesn't touch the ground. A surface burst kicks up a lot of dust and irradiates that dust. The subsurface burst is even worse. Underwater bursts we've, we discovered with the uh, Operation Crossroads of Bikini Atomic Test. I have some pictures of that you'll all remember. Um, we, uh, it's very, very bad because the nuclear, nuclear weapon detonates underwater. There's a burst of a neutron and it's surrounded by chlorine and surrounded by sodium. All that get activated and all that go airborne. Um, we'll talk about the cobalt bomb and the neutron bomb as two special radi types of radiological weapon um, later, but those are those are the specific types that have a, a radiological component. Now, the dirty bomb is considered when considered in 1945 when we uh, the Manhattan Project was finding it difficult to actually fi figure that they can get the uh, bomb to explode with nuclear yield. Just taking what we had and uh, spreading it on, you know, spreading it over the uh, over Japan. Plutonium, especially, is very, very dangerous stuff. Um, as, uh, as far as dirty bombs, there's a terrorist connection, fear, and area denial. As far as what they can do, we'll discuss more in, more in dirty bombs. Also, this is more. This is kind of a menu of what we're going to talk about. Um, we can be exposed to radiation through accidents, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island. That's the most prominent example. Um, there are also industrial irradiators and radiography sources that we can be exposed to and loss are still in medical and industrial radionuclides. Uh, and then there are targeted, targeted weapons, the, as in polonium-210, we'll discuss that as well. I gave you a pro I promise to talk to you about the bikini series of atomic tests, Operation Crossroads. This is probably not the picture, not the iconic picture you know. This is the, um, the uh, ABLE test. What you've seen is the Baker test, which came about three weeks later. But the ABLE test was first. is actually the fourth atomic bomb ever detonated uh, after, of course, Trinity, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. 
So we've we've moved forward from World War II by not quite a year, and we you know, set off this airburst 600 feet. It's a 23 kiloton nuclear weapon, which is the same same physics package as the Trinity and Nagasaki tests. It's interesting to note the same uh, same bomb was the, the first four of the first five bombs ever detonated. The same exact bomb uh, design. Um, now, the reason we did this is we started uh, in 1946 when uh, Manhattan, it's still a Manhattan Project thing, and we're wondering what these bombs can do. One of the things we have to do as far as deciding our post-war uh, construction and uh, military strategy is decide where the prospect of a Navy is. Are there still going to be navies or to have nu uh, nuclear bombs made it um, yeah, um, impossible to actually put spend a lot of money on an expensive warship? Well, is it too easy to destroy so some uh, congressman said, you know, I'd like to take a whole bunch of ships and drop some bombs on them and see what would actually happen. And I think that was in November 45. So somebody thought this would be a good idea. And they put together a whole bunch of ships that are in Bikini Atoll. We took the all the people off Bikini Atoll and we dropped this bomb on it. It was uh, set for an airburst of 600 feet and it was heavily instrumented. We had a whole bunch of things of um uh, ships off in the distance watching the explosion, measuring the, the flash that told them how big the actual yield was. And then we moved in immediately afterward, people in anti-contamination suits with respiratory apparatus to measure the contamination in the ships as well, see how they, uh, they survived. And it turns out most of them did pretty well. Uh, there wasn't a whole, weren't a whole lot of uh, uh, ships, ships sunk. And there were a lot of big ships there. The, the things that went down were pretty small and pretty close to the uh, um, pretty close to the detonation. If you were more than about five, six hundred yards away from this, you know, uh, a warship built for combat, you should do all right. Mark, was this a, a uranium-based bomb? Is one of our this, questions. This is this is this is the plutonium uh, plutonium inversion. The same thing as Hiroshima and uh, Trinity, uh, Nagasaki, rather, and Trinity. This is the picture you've probably seen. This is the Baker test. So it took place three weeks afterward. Um, you can see the, the these are, are these are battleships. Usually, but you know, some of the larger ships, every type of ship was placed around it um, in, in a thoughtful pattern to say, okay, this size ship will move it this far away. Uh, but there are some very famous ships being destroyed in this test. Saratoga is in there, the Nagato, the Japanese battleship, the one Japanese battleship that survived the war. Prince Eugen, the German heavy cruiser that escorted Bismarck out on her run, um, all, all underneath that cloud. Um, this is, uh, that cloud is not actually um, water being thrown away. This is what it's called a Wilson cloud. It is a shock wave that is making the humid air over the lagoon temporarily lagoon. You can see the beach right here. This is in close, about 300 feet of water, uh, and the detonation was at 90 feet down. So this is a, a, an underwater burst. But um, it's making the humid air temporarily opaque. Uh, so that, and if you, if you ever watch a video, I should try to get a video sometime. I saw it. It expands very quickly and then disappears like it goes away. This is actually, this crown is actually water being thrown up. And I have another picture that will show what this looks like a few, just a few seconds after this. Um, yeah, that's it. This is the crown being thrown up. Um, this is the battleship Arkansas. There's controversy over whether the battleship Arkansas is being stood on her nose. In this 300 feet of water, uh, but most people seem to think it's actually a shadow because that yeah, the Arkansas is about 23,000 tons displacement, if memory serves, um, and and that's not even a even a nuclear weapon isn't going to turn her on her nose, uh, to, uh, and it, that's really a shadow of the water being thrown up around her. Uh, so same bomb, it's the same type of bomb, but she's 90 feet underwater. When they started to move in after this. They uh, they had to pull up, pull back away again as they started to monitor what the radiation levels were. The the radiation levels from this burst were enormous, and they had to wait a few more weeks for things to calm down before they can go in and start to take their sample. But in the meantime, the Saratoga, you know, grand grand old lady of our aircraft carrier fleet sank. A whole bunch of other things sank. We learned that uh, in terms of attacking a fleet, an underwater burst is a whole lot more dangerous than an air burst. Uh, but it's also a whole lot dirtier. Okay, let's get back to some of the nuclear stuff. Uh, Cobalt-60 is one of the more dangerous radioactive isotopes that are made by the process of nuclear uh, nuclear fission. Um, it's a half-life is 5.27 years. It's made usually by multiple decays of iron-58. Um, 
The iron, of course, is going to be part of the structure of any nuclear reactor or bomb. So nu nu neutrons hit uh, neutrons hit uh, uh, iron. It will turn it into uh, or radiation. It's, it's, if it's the iron, it will turn it into nickel. That will turn it into cobalt. But anyway, uh, decays the decays of nickel uh, emit uh, it decays to nickel sixty, emitting two gamma rays with energies of one point one seven and two point and one point three three mega electron volts. Those are pretty high energies. That's considered radiation. That's going to be dangerous to you. And it's a twofer, so you get two shots. It's like um, it's like an automatic weapon that the uh, fires a burst, an automatic two round burst. Most things decay, and there's one thing getting uh, leaving it that might hit you. So uh, it's the formula. It, it, uh, a neutron comes close to it. It becomes cobalt sixty. Um, it will then decay to uh, uh, nickel sixty. Give off an electron. A neutrino and the two gamma rays that will cause damage to you. Um, the energy per gram is nearly 30 times that of the decay of plutonium-339. So that's it's. It, this is one of the more we highlight this because it's one of the more, more dangerous things. We uh, uses include radiography and some radiation therapies. I've used cobalt-60 as a radiography source. Radiography is what we call an X-ray, only when you're X-raying pipes and joints and things like that. Um, the uh, cobalt, the cobalt bomb was a plan that came up, uh, we came up with in the 60s, uh, would make an extremely dirty weapon to contaminate large areas. The idea was you take a, your nuclear weapon that's going to have a huge, when it goes off, a huge neutron flux, and you coat the exterior with cobalt to activate it into cobalt 60. So in addition to the natural radiation that the nuclear weapon's going to make, you make all this cobalt that's, uh, as, we see, uh, as we have seen, extremely dirty. Uh, well, we never deployed it. We don't think anyone actually ever deployed it. It was uh, just it was discussed as a possibility of how you make things really bad. Um, now, very, uh, it will also create very long-term contamination compared to your garden variety nuclear weapons. You, the, you can't say what the half-life of a of nuclear fallout is because nuclear fallout is composed of all kinds of things which have a different half-life. So that's a cocktail of stuff. But as a general rule, after 48 hours. The, the radiation you're getting from fallout from a nuclear weapon has fallen to 1% of what the digital value was at uh, within a few minutes of the explosion. So you can wait that out in a um, uh, wait wait that out sometime in a in a fallout shelter. Uh, but this cobalt half life is 5.3 years. You can't wait that out. Uh, fallout is eight times more intense a year uh, than regular garden variety nuclear weapons. A year later, it's eight times more intense. Uh, residual fall, uh, residual radiation, and 150 times more intense five years later. So if you, there's a good, you know, if you spread cobalt 60 around any area, that area is likely to be uninhabited, uninhabitable. All right. So I said we talk about the neutron bomb. It's also called sometimes the ERW or enhanced radiation weapon. The the theory of a neutron bomb is you, you actually make a, a low yield thermonuclear weapon that's designed to maximize the lethal radiation, uh, neutron radiation, while minimizing the blast itself. And now, when you normally when you design a nuclear weapon, you design it to reflect the neutrons back into the core of the bomb. When the bomb goes off, the neutrons all get reflected back in, increase the yield. Here, the intent is to let a lot of the neutrons out. As many uh, the neutrons themselves do the damage, while the the amount of blast damage is, is minimal. Uh, this is considered an anti-personnel weapon. It's also an, an anti-ballistic missile weapon, which we'll talk about how that works. Uh, the idea was that that would penetrate armor more effectively than a conventional warhead. A conventional nuclear warhead, usually a tank does a pretty good job at 500 to 1,000 yards. Uh, the radiation will go into the tank, and that could hurt people. If you enhance the radiation, that uh, would find people more uh, find things more dangerous. Um, so it was a concept against, for use against mass Soviet armored divisions over allied nations, notably in West Germany. Now, the Europeans didn't like the idea too much. Um, we operationally deployed it on the W-66 warhead. W means warhead, and 66 is the type. That went on the Sprint missile. We'll talk about that as an anti-ballistic missile soon, system soon. That wasn't an anti-armored device. Um, the idea there was that a burst of neutrons, uh, we launched this missile up at an incoming ICBM, it would get within range of the ICBM a few, uh, about 100 meters by design, and the burst of neutrons from the neutron bomb that got set off would cause the, the nearby warheads in the incoming ICBM to partially undergo fission. 
we, in other words, make a fizzle in the air so that by the time it, it got you know, dropped to air burst on your city, there wouldn't be enough fissionable fission material left to get a nuclear yield. And it's, you know, it'll be a little bit dirty, but dirty is a whole lot better than getting your city flattened with a nuclear warhead. So the ABM would have, uh, have we believe the Soviets had the uh, equivalent design, but they never shared that with us. Uh, we, of course, had the Safeguard ABM system operational briefly. The Soviets uh, put an a their own ABM system up operated for a little bit longer. As far as battlefield use of anti-Soviet armor, we've started producing in 1981 a stockpile of uh, hydrogen, of um, neutron bomb warheads, which we call the uh, W70-3s for the MGM-50 Lance missile. They, were, they, were, they remained in the stockpile. We never deployed them. The, Euro, the Europeans just didn't want them. Uh, we had them available and we were, uh, if we needed. We tried them in 1992, of course, after the end of the, end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. These are the two things we're talking about. Sprint missile on the right, on the top, was part of the Safeguard ABM system. This was the last ditch. The, the long range was the Spartan. The last ditch missile, last ditch missile was the Sprint. Um, now she's launched at something that's about to enter the atmosphere. This is a, an incredible weapon. Watching it launch, uh, it, it's there and then it disappears and there's a cloud of smoke. It, under, it has 100 gravity it's acceleration. Uses an ablative skin because it's going to build up a tremendous amount of heat. Um, it's launched at uh, a weapon that's usually about 60 kilometers for intercept. It's got to get up there fast because it's an ICBM that's coming at a 10,000 kilometers an hour or more. Uh, and you've already launched a long-range missile at it that missed, so you're launching this as a point defense weapon. So it's got to be very, very fast. Uh, Another question? Yes. Do neutron weapons disrupt electrical gear? The, the neutrons typically won't, but uh, the the uh, warhead itself is likely to uh, on some level. It's not uh, as far as an EMP effect. It won't be an, it won't be any more enhanced as far as EMP than any other uh, any other type of nuclear weapon. Um, now, we, we put the safeguard ABM system up to protect the minimum and ICBM fields. Our deal with the Soviets as far as anti-ballistic missiles is that each of us could deploy uh, two ABM fields, one to protect the city and one, one to protect an ICBM field. Um, we didn't think it was possible to protect the city, so we didn't do that. Put, well, put it up to protect an ICBM field, I believe, in South Dakota. Um, and the uh, Soviets put one up to protect the uh, essentially the, the long range to protect everything in the Leningrad Moscow corridor. I don't know how they how long they operated it. We put the, put the system together and op made it operational for one day, at, and then we shut it down again. That tells me that we wanted to get our foot in the door, saying yes, we abide by this treaty and we stand by our right to do this, but we didn't see it as worthwhile. Uh, down the lower side, we have, we'll show the Lance missile that had a neutron warhead battlefield. It's a battlefield ballistic missile, 45 to 75 mile range, depending on what type of warhead. Um, and she carried a 100 kiloton warhead or the neutron bomb, the W70-3 we talked about. And the, the missile itself was operational 72 to 92. The uh, neutron bomb was available at 9, and 81 for it, but never, again, never deployed. Okay, uh, here we discuss what the neutron bomb, uh, neutron bomb versus the fission bomb is, the, the, where the energy is going in terms of its percentage. Blast, thermal energy, which is heat, uh, prompt radiation, or residual radiation. And the important part is here, the prompt radiation from a regular fission bomb is five per, about 5%, five where uh, the way the uh, enhanced radiation weapon or a neutron bomb is designed is 45 to, uh, 30 to 45%. And uh, whereas the blast and thermal energies are all reduced and residual radiation is all reduced, the, the more the power is going into the prompt radiation, which is what gives you that burst of neutrons. Okay, we, I said we talk about dirty bombs a little bit. Uh, sometimes in you know, national security circles, we'd say a radiological dispersion device or RDD. Uh, this combines radioactive material with a conventional explosive to contaminated area. It's primarily area, area denial against civilians. This is a, more of a terrorist weapon than anything else. Um, creates psychological, not physical harm through ignorance, mass panic, and terror. People get scared when you say there's radioactive, radioactive material here or there's contamination. Uh, and you start talking to them about Curies and Rads and Rankins, and their eyes glaze over and they run. Uh, 
but a test analysis by U.S. Department of Energy. They ran some tests. They took some probable sources the terrorists might find, exploded them in test conditions, uh, so, uh, assuming nothing is done to clean up and everybody stays in the area. They said the radiation levels would be fairly high but not fatal. So you don't want to stick around if one of these things go off, but you don't need to go running for your life either. You can't live there until somebody cleans it up. Uh, recent analysis from Chernobyl confirms that the effect on many of the surrounding area, uh, effect on many of the surrounding area, if not in proximity, was almost negligible. Um, it's sometimes they call weapons mass disruption for the fact that we're they're trying to um, try to cause panic uh, rather than actually kill people. They wouldn't mind killing people, but they don't have the weapon to do that. Um, and consider the contamination and decontamination of thousands of casualties uh, in an affected area. Um, uh, will take considerable time and expense. The area has to be areas are partly unusable, causing economic damage. If some one of these went off in the downtown area of a major city or an industrial area, it will cause economic damage as well. Uh, and I talked about polonium as a radiological weapon. Polonium is a rare, highly, highly radioactive metal with no stable isotopes. You're not going to find this in nature because if it's, if it's that highly radioactive, it's all decayed to nothing. Um, it's got a short half-life, so uh, polonium-110, the half-life is 138 days, uh, and it usually is a, a daughter product of natural uranium-238 decay. So it has to be manufactured. Uh, and slightly longer lived isotopes exist, they're much harder to produce. So polonium-210 is if you want to find polonium. We have another question. Yes, of course. Uh, this one is was the uh, W70-3 neutron bomb warhead ever tested at the NNSS. Mm, uh, what was the NNSS again? National Nuclear... Uh, heck, sorry, go ahead. Uh, but now I, I don't believe that we, I don't believe that was ever ever tested as a, a nuclear bomb. By that point, we were we had treaty restrictions that prevented us from setting anything off in Nevada the atmosphere. National, Nevada National Security. Nevada State. National. Oh no, it, 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 we would have tested it out in the Pacific if anywhere. Um, but um, I don't think we were setting off. Any, well, I guess we we're doing underground bursts at that point. But yeah, um, uh, I don't I don't know that the Type Three was ever tested. So sorry, I couldn't tell you that. Um, if it was, it was certainly underground, because that's what we had to, had to be doing at the time. Um, anyway, uh, Madame Curie discovered polonium in uh, 1898, and that in fact the uh, polonium was named after Poland, which is where she was from. Um, she extracted it from ore pitch blend, identified solely by its strong radioactivity. That's otherwise they wouldn't have found there was an element there. Wait, there's something really, really. Uh, uh, unusual about what we just extracted. Um, there are a few applications all related to its radioactivity, heaters and space probes, anti-static devices, sources of neutrons and alpha particles, and poison. It's an extremely dangerous thing to work with. Okay, let's talk about Alexander Valterovich uh, Litvin, 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 Litvin. In Enkel, I have to. I haven't. Done, I haven't given this lecture in about ten months. I have to remind myself. Uh, he was a Russian defector and a former officer of the Russian, Russian FSB, which is, of course, the, their internal security service. And uh, former used to be used to be a um, uh, secret uh, KGB second chief director. Um, he specialized in organized crime. He coined the phrase "mafia state" to describe the generalized corruption uh, existed in, in Russia today. Uh, in 1998, he accused superiors of ordering the assassination of Russian tycoon and oligarch Boris Berezovsky. Uh, he was arrested twice, two acquittals. He, they were obviously political prosecutions. Uh, he finally decided, okay, I got to get out of Russia. He fled to London with his family in the year 2000. Um, he worked as a journalist, writer, and consultant to British intelligence services, wrote the books Blowing Up Russia, Terror from Within, and the Lubyanka Criminal Group. Uh, which he accused Russian secret services of staging apartment bombings. Well, uh, basically, serious criminal stuff to all help Putin uh, get into power and, and remain in power, um, including including uh, assassinations and terrorist acts. He was hospitalized in November first, uh, 2006, where it was diagnosed to be polonium-210 poisoning. Now, you see how hard it is to get polonium. Somebody's got to make that, and somebody's got to deliver it. Yeah, there was no source of pol uh, polonium in his flat in, in uh, London. Uh, he died on the 23rd, the first known victim of polonium-210-induced acute, radi acute, acute radiation syndrome. 
um, uh, January 2016, a public inquest concluded that the murder was, in, in fact, an FSB operation. His wife went to bat legally through through every legal uh, legal source and avenue she could, and there are enough that are not under the uh, under the thumb of the Putin regime that she was able to get a, get an open inquest that said, yeah, he was murdered. Um, and we talked about iodine tablets. We see that a lot in the, you know, the, so in the new Chernobyl series, hand, the, the handing out iodine. Here, take one of these. Iodine does one thing for you, uh, potassium iodine. It reduces the risk of cancer in some situation because of slower intake of ambient radio iodine. Uh, radio iodide uh, is a product of um, the nu uh, nuclear, re nuclear weapons and nuclear reactor accidents. And it could ra an iodine, ra radio iodide could be ingested and absorbed by the thyroid gland. So if you take a, you know, uh, take a lot of potassium iodine, uh, iodide, it, it, keeps your it keeps your body from absorbing any additional iodide, so you don't absorb the radioactive iodide. Therefore, your, gland, your uh, thyroid gland doesn't, ex doesn't absorb it, and it will protect your gland for a 24-hour period. It will not prevent radiation sickness. It will not prevent any of the effects of exposure to ionizing radiation. It keeps you from getting this one thing and the one thing is pretty bad if, in fact, you are in the vicinity of a nuclear, act, nuclear accident or weapons test. Okay, and I guess I'm well ahead of time here, but th I wanted to thank you all for coming. Please go and redeem your tickets if you have not already, and I'll, of course, open the floor for tests. Uh, for for ex for um, discussions as long as uh, as long as we're here, I'll I'll talk after till after midnight if you want. Uh, but please come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. for our panel discussion on 19th century science fiction authors uh, in the future as seen from the 19th century. We'll discuss uh, Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, a number of other people. Uh, you're welcome to. It's online, but you're welcome to show up in garb. Uh, try to upload your pictures to our Facebook or or YouTube page, and we'll see if we could show people. Um, but that might be, that might, we see if we have, have fun, if we can get the technology working. Uh, tomorrow, other major events uh, here. You can check the Gen Con site, do a search for NSDM. Uh, preparing for a pandemic, we'll have a, uh, a newcomer to our, our speaker program talking about a war game of the 2016 Rio Olympics before, it, before the Olympics, about what would happen about a, um, a pandemic release at the Rio Olympics. Extending our reach, robotic space flight, uh, Saturday at you know, Saturday at uh, 8 to 10 p.m. and uh, 10 to 10 p.m. to well after midnight is our global hotspots panel tomorrow on Saturday, and that's our signature. Uh, what what uh, uh, things is CNN missing? Uh, and on Sunday, we normally don't give lectures on Sunday at Gen Con because we're too busy going home. But we're, guess what? We are home, so we're giving lectures uh, Sunday morning at uh, 10 a.m. to noon on the intersection of cyber war and statecraft, uh, and uh, then at Sunday at noon to two on data and power in the information age. Uh, so uh, that's uh, where I think that's what I have. Oh, learn more about war gaming. Uh, we uh, do you want to discuss uh, con connections, Merle? Certainly. If any of you are interested in game design, particularly on uh, things that would be accurate simulations as opposed to just Euro games or generic. Connections is the place for you to come because this is where the professionals meet both from the commercial board gaming and war gaming universe and from the professional DOD and contractor universe. So we frequently have people that you would expect to see at that kind of a convention like folks from Decision Games and a few other organizations. Most of the folks are DOD types, but you'll hear people talk about how you design a war game, what a war game is good for, uh, what your war game's not good for, and we've got some real special keynote speakers this year because former Deputy Defense Secretary Robert Work is going to be there, who's, in, in my experience, the only guy I ever met in a suit in DoD that understood war gaming. Uh, so that's sort of an endorsement. Um, but, you know, it is a really great place if you're interested in meeting people who do it as a profession. Okay, so does anybody have any other questions for Mark at this time? <clears throat> if not, we uh, will. Uh, I see. I see a question from father and son. Was polonium the one ingested into some Soviet dissidents? I believe it probably was. I also, yeah. popular culture, I believe it was, uh, there was a, uh, a Madam Secretary episode 
where they were dealing with someone who was obviously a target of, of, a, of Russian assassins using polonium. Um, uh, the Lance was tested underground, but not, well, the Lance is a missile, so I don't know how you can test that underground. Um, is that a test site? Okay. Funny, Wade. Yeah. Go ahead. All right, so last, uh, okay. Can you talk about protection measures like bomb shelters, basements, et cetera? Okay, uh, yeah. Um, uh, it's all, it's all going to be based on, uh, on how bad this, this stuff is behind you. But, you know, bomb shelter is obviously made to, to protect you from the radiation and protect you from the contamination as well. Um, now, where I am sitting in Connecticut, if there were ever World War III, there probably would not be a bomb shelter uh, sturdy enough to protect me from the number of nuclear weapons that would have been going off around me in the 1980s. Uh, so... Uh, one of the things you need is you need to, get to you need to get it. Um, uh, it needs to be airtight if you're going to keep out the contamination. If you're going to be setting up some type of a uh, fallout shelter, you need to, to you know, your air supply to come in through a higher particular uh, if a high particular HEPA filter, high efficiency particular air filter, uh, because you just let the outside air in, you're going to let the contamination in as well. You, uh, like I said, if you want to wait out a nuclear attack in some type of a secure location for about 48 hours, you'll find that the fallout level is fallen to 1% of what it was. That could still be lethal in some cases. Um, one of the things you might want to consider doing, is that we talked about surface contamination. Every pile of dust or fallout is giving off beta, uh, is giving off gamma, primarily is your, is your fear. So if that dust is accumulating outside your door, you might want to put on some booties and gloves and go out and sweep it away so uh, so it gets farther away from you. Time time, distance and shielding, uh, what uh, our, my uh, colleague Ryan started to discuss, uh, time limit your exposure to it, but distance get farther away from it. So you, there's a one over R squared. So if you double your distance from where the source is, this, this pile of contamination that's irradiating you is, you're cutting down the amount of radiation you're getting by a factor of four. Uh, in shielding, keep keep something between you and it. Uh, water does a pretty good job in large quantities. Lead, of course, is fine, but it's hard to find huge amounts of lead lying around. Uh, oh, and you have another question? Yeah, yeah. Special con any special consideration for radio radiation weapons or effects in space? Uh, radiation weapons or effects in space. Um, Remember, well, space. Uh, some some of these part, some of these uh, things are going to be dissipating in the atmosphere. But gamma is what you're worried about. I'm, I'd say nothing really special. If you're going into space in a spacecraft, uh, your the spacecraft probably is already designed to accept uh, accept radiation at some level. Especially if the spacecraft designed to go outside the, the Van Allen belts. The the Apollo capsules designed to go to the moon had more radiation shielding than any than the Mercury capsules because they weren't going to be going that far up. So um, so I'd say if you're in a spaceship, you probably already have some more shielding than that typically. But no, nothing else I can think of. Now, there's also the electromagnetic pulse effect. If we're talking about nuclear weapons going up in space above our um, um, above our, um, our they'll hit our, hit our magnetic field, uh, they'll generate a gamma burst, hit our magnetic field, and start making a, 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 a pulse of uh, gamma. Uh, that could, that could be dangerous too. But that that's a little little far afield from what we're talking about now. I do have an entire lecture we'll give. Probably next year on electromagnetic pulse. I've given it a few times at Gen Con, but it's, it's due. Um, what was the last question? Extreme distress of government. How do we? Give me a energy? second to queue it up. Um, it was a recap on um, what will block different forms of radiation. Okay. Um, yeah, you're right. Sheet of newspaper will stop alpha. A thin, thin sheet of steel. I'm not sure thin, but if you get a that, that will do. That will do all right. But I'd, I'd sooner just try to move a couple of the uh, file cabinets between me and beta. And beta. There's a there was an interesting series called um, uh, what was it? Uh, Doomsday scenarios. And there was a, uh, a former Navy SEAL that talks about how you can survive this. 
And there was an actual an episode where he said, oh, yeah, the, the postulation was you were in a center city where some terrorists set off a nuclear weapon. And he talked about and he showed people you get, getting a pe- bunch of people into an office. If you can't get out of the center city in the first 15 minutes, the fallout starts to come down. You got to find a way to hunker down and you, you get into the middle of the building away from the windows. And, and he moved all the file cabinets around. So they had this little enclosure that will circle them, and they, they raided all the um, vending machines for, for whatever food they can get, got a couple buckets in because you have to urinate and defecate. <laughs> and uh, you don't want to do that. You, know, you walk outside for the, the second to take take it in and, and get and do your business. But um, the, the plan is, okay, to spend the next, next several days hunkered down behind a couple of feet of paper. And that does a pretty good job. Uh, so given the trust of government during pandemic, how do planners factor in that response to nuke events, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I would say I think the, uh, D- uh, you might want to come to our lecture tomorrow on the real pandemics. Uh, Doug, do you think you're going to be talking about things like that? I saw you on the list. Uh, I mean, one anyway. of the things is things have changed a lot since they tended to do standard plans. Standard plans come out on annual or multi-year cycles, so they may not have incorporated into official planning the kinds of effects we've seen uh, based on how people have responded to the pandemic. But there's always been a certain degree of how do you convince the public to do what you want without pushing them physically around with military force or police forces. And without, you know, scaring the daylight out of them to the point where you scare them too much, you can't control them anymore. And Uh, Doug will talk about that a little bit in his presentation tomorrow. Okay, that'd be good, that'd be good. Uh, so please, please come on back. Please come back and talk about that. Uh, please come back and, and look at that. And uh, uh, with nuclear facility cooling pools, or how they would fail if left unattended. Um, I have no specific familiarity with them, but I, I would imagine. Well, you, you drop, you take a something that's hot, like a spent reactor, nuclear reactor uh, core ele- fuel element. You drop it into a pool for a few months. It, it's just it's got its decay heat, so it's going to continue to to warm. If you left that in the atmosphere, exposed to the air, it would overheat, it would ultimately melt, and you'd have a real radiological mess in your hands. So you just drop it in a pool. All it needs to do is be immersed in water. So um, unless the whole pool evaporates, and that's going to take months, you probably won't have much of a problem with it. Uh, the if, uh, And after months, anyway, the, the temperature, the um, uh, the decay heat from the re- the reactor uh, it was going to decay away to the point where you're not going to have that much heating of the element after a few months anyway. You just need a few months of the thing. So this Security is the, the nasty one, and I'll give the answer right off. The answer is absolutely yes, because basically you need explosive and some radioactive material. And one of the things that the Defense Department and Homeland Defense have really been concerned about is hospital nuclear waste from radiological testing. When you have testing done on you at the hospital, there's radioactive waste in many cases, and a little bit of that can at least incite fear. They did not really figure for the most part that there are groups sophisticated enough to do large dirty bombs, but that's not out of the realm of possibility. The big thing is the threat of a dirty bomb and the indication of some radioactive spread, even if it's within a building, is considered a, a terror weapon more than it is a military weapon with direct impact. Yeah, and if you, especially if you want to consider the um, penchant for our news media to sensationalize things, uh, Merle saying you just, you know, a, a, ter- a terrorist could easily get his hands on discarded radioactive waste from medical facilities, uh, wrap a, a couple of M80, wrap it around a couple of M80s, and set that off somewhere. Next thing they know, they got first responders in trying to figure out what this little explosion was, and the radiation sensors say there's radiation here. Now the the press is going to go crazy with that. Uh, they're going to think it's the end of the world, and they're going to start broadcasting it's the end of the world. It necessarily isn't, but now you got talking heads on from the government trying to say I'm from the government, everything is fine. Yeah, well we've heard that before, so. Uh, that, that's where it's, that's where, where where we're starting to head. Is this is a terror weapon, a disruption weapon, um, or more more so than something that's actually going to seriously hurt somebody. Now, if you wanted to seriously hurt somebody, and you got a little bit of that. Um, now, if you got a, well, you know, and you got a little bit of that material, try to get into a water supply. That's where that's what I'd worry about. 
Now, is the water a moderator or coolant? Cool question. It's just a coolant. Uh, you, you know, if, if you're you're trying to cool a uh, spent radi a spent fuel rod, you don't want to moderate it. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if you do or not. Uh, yeah, uh, the question is, I remember reading the water is quite a good uh, at absorbing radiation. Are there any other materials? Um, surpri not surprisingly good, but you know, but lead, of course, is good. It's very, very heavy. Um, it, uh, paraffin, wax. Wax does a pretty good job um, but it's uh, for, of, uh, do of, doing, of uh, doing that. Water is good because it's easy to move it somewhere. You just get a, get a, you just, you just get a hose and you start f filling things with water. Um, uh, often what you need is something that just, just gives you a physical separation for wherever the contamination is. Um, but um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, steel, paraffin, um, uh, water. Uh, uh, we talked about paper being used in terms of moving the file cabinets and, and a lot of books. A uh, few feet, a few feet of something can do an awful lot for you. Uh, again, it depends on what type of radiation. The gamma is gamma is going to go through a lot of stuff. It can, but um, uh, if if we start to talk about you know, 10, 20 feet of water, get a pool between you and the source, you're, it's going to knock down the um, uh, your exposure by, you know, to, you know to, or maybe an order of magnitude if you're lucky. Okay, any other questions? What's the next, Merle? Generally, most medical waste have a short half-life, but excess um, excess of equipment uh, with a radiation source is also concerned. Um, that is why generally it is considered terror weapon. I don't know. You discuss air burst and water burst weapons and effects. Uh, what effects would a ground or under uh, underground bunker strike create? Um, it would. Uh, it would typically, if it hit the ground and or you know, dug into the ground, it would it would typically irradiate. A lot of the the soil that's going to kick up. So yeah, those those would be those would be worse than an air burst. Um, to me, in terms of how how bad radiologically they would be, air burst is the is the least bad, and then ground burst, underground burst, and underwater burst. Mad mutually assured destruction probably keep us out of nuclear with the USSR. Do you think the same could likely work with newer nuclear powers like Iran or North Korea? Uh, it's it's always questionable how rational they are as actors. Uh, one of the things that they, um, you know, of course, we came close to the, close to nuclear with the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis as a series of accidents that occurred. Once we were looking at each other very closely with our our missiles raised and fueled. And armed, uh, that's when the problems start to ha started to happen because every little thing now could start start to trigger. Uh, Iran, they could convince themselves that they have to do this or something's wrong. Uh, uh, so no, no, North Korea, Iran. I, I'm not really sure who's running the thing. Sometimes in Iran, one of the things I'm worrying about most with these uh, secondary secondary countries is their degree of, of control. One thing you got to say about the Russians is they had firm control of everything. Uh, and you're you're pretty sure that uh, uh, some rogue uh, Russian author wasn't going to be able to do this. Uh, I'm not sure that would be the case with an, a nuclear weapon that North Korea has uh, available, deployable. And one of the things I'm worried about, if uh, if and when Iran does develop its nuclear weapons, uh, is uh, this, uh, is someone in their their regime who has access to it shunting it directly to Hezbollah. Uh, in which case, we, you know, there's no degree to no you know, no mutually assured destruction involved. You can't threaten them with destroying anything because they have nothing they care about. Um, ideology plays a part, and in Iran, for example, they you know, there there are factions there that think if they die in a holy war, that they're guaranteed they're guaranteed heaven. Uh, okay. What do we need to create proper radioactive waste storage? Uh, we we need more radioactive waste. Uh, there are schemes to and techniques to do, to deal with it, but when we started to shut down or close down, and stop building more nuclear reactors, it became not technical, technically, not um, engineering wise uh, feasible to build the facilities. We well, need. from the from but the standpoint of, of the reading I've done, there are two viable options now. One being more expensive than the other. 
The most expensive one is embedding radioactives in glass beads, because what you're trying to do is make it stable so it doesn't get into the water table or the air. Uh, yeah. The other one that makes tremendous sense, even though there is a lot of opposition to it, is the salt mine solution. Because putting it in one of those, that's one of the most stable things you've got. And the biggest problem with nuclear power is the byproducts never go away. And until the technology evolves or we come up with something totally new in the way we do it, there's not a good disposal method. Uh, in my career, I worked for the real government surplus people and went out to places like Savannah River where we talked about hazardous waste disposal, not so much the radioactives, but other things that they did there. And I got to see their facilities and reading the reports about that and the facility out in Washington State, you know, anything that requires a human to maintain it and a steel containment mechanism or a pool, whether it's filled with clay or whatever else, doesn't work. The biggest single problem we have now, Rao, more than solid waste, is liquid waste. Uh, that's far more numerous. It, uh, most of the hospital waste is liquid waste of some kind. Um, you know, there's a lot more. We probably could do a whole presentation on that, and I haven't boned up on it, but in general, those are the issues. Uh, I'm sorry, Sean, I'm not familiar with them. I can't tell you about it. I think what he's addressing is how some reactors use the byproducts of other reactors to run, but that still doesn't address the, the medical waste and other stuff. And neither of us are really an expert on that. Yeah, uh, I know that, uh, you know, if we, the uh, breeder reactor, for example, may, uh, turns uh, your U-238 into plutonium-239, and you can put that in a reactor if you want to. The primary use for making plutonium-239 is to make nuclear weapons, but there's no reason you can't make a nuclear, uh, nuclear design a nuclear reactor around it. Um, and the breeder reactors themselves are meant to, to run longer by... The initial fission, when you just start up a new core, is based on U-238, uh, U-235. However, uh, you build up, the, you turn the U-238 into the plutonium-239, and that keeps the reactivity up so you can run it longer. Okay. Okay, well, I think that's the last of the questions, so we're going to end the broadcast. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Hope you join us for our other events. And uh, keep following us on Facebook. And now that we've got a YouTube channel, any videos we do will be posted there. So have a safe weekend and a good time at Gen Con. And join us tomorrow at 10 a.m.